Hello Sunday School and thank you for joining me in this time as we preview our next lesson cup coming this Sunday as we continue on our study in 2nd Chronicles chapter 14 in the life of King Asa uh, the fourth king of the divided kingdom he was the great great grandson of of King Solomon uh, so I'm sorry he was the third king of the divided kingdom we're going to continue to study in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, we're going to begin with verses 9 through 15. And we're going to be looking at the first battle that Asa had. And we're going to use this battle as an illustration of how we as believers and children of God, saved by Jesus Christ, can go about fighting the battles in our lives. Because truth be told, it's not a question of if we will have a battle, or if we will have to come against anything. But the question is, when will we be in a battle? For we know that we have an enemy in the, in the devil, in Satan, that serpent. And his objective for all children of God is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He doesn't come bearing gifts. He doesn't come with blessings. He doesn't come with favor. But he's coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy anything that was created by God and our responsibilities as believers is to be prepared for the battle and to know who we're fighting with in the battle and who's fighting with us during the battle. But not only do we have an enemy of Satan, but we also have the enemy of our own flesh and we have the enemy of this world. So when you're looking at the trifecta of the enemies we have to face, Satan, the world, and the flesh, it will behoove us to be prepared for battle uh, as we uh, face these enemies, whether it's uh, uh, the, the enemy trying to, trying to steal our joy through addictions or trying to steal our worship through evil habits or if the enemy is trying to destroy us through people that we work with or our neighbors or people in our own families, we have to be aware that there is a battle going on. But God has not left us without the resources he has not left us without the weapons necessary to be successful in this battle. So as we read 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 9 through 15, we're going to be reading it from the standpoint of God took care of Asa in his battle, and God will take care of us in our battles as we trust and believe in him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the holy writ of your word, which is ever living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword that brings life, that brings healing, that brings instruction, that brings rebuke and correction, and that brings training so that we can be your sons and daughters that you've called us to be. Give us unusual understanding of your word so that we can please you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 9 through 15, I pray that you read along with me these verses so that we can have a good understanding of the context what we're reading and be better prepared in teaching and sharing this lesson. So verses 9 through 15 read this way. It says, Now, uh, now Zerah the Ethiopian came out against Asa and his army with the army of a million men and 300 chariots, and he came to Mersha. So Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up in a battle formation in a valley of Zephtah, at Mersha. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one besides you to help in a battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you and in your name have come against this multitude, O Lord. You are our God. Let not, let not man prevail against you. We'll stop there because I just want to gain our thoughts from those first three verses of how Asa approached the battle that came to him. And we need to know that no matter what we're going through, no matter the battle that we face, we can depend on God. And as we learned in last week's lesson, we, we see that Asa in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, he was a good and right uh, man. He was good and right in the sight of God, it says in Asa. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 2, that Asa was good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. And it, I know this is not part of our lesson that we're previewing today, but I just, it just 
it just reminds me that God is looking at us. It says in the sight of God. God has his eyes on us as his children. The Bible describes us as the apple of his eye. We're precious in his sight. So God sees us. God knows us. God beholds us. And Asa, it said, was good and right in the sight of his God. He had a relationship with him. Why was Asa good and right? Asa was good and right because he took serious his relationship with God. He took serious his obedience to God. And because he took serious his relationship and his obedience with God, God took serious his protection over Asa. And if you recall from my lesson last week, Asa in his relationship with God as the newly installed king of Israel, he had to tear down some things that his fathers had built up. His father, his father was Abijah, and his, 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 his father, father was Rehoboam, and his father, father was Solomon, and his father, father, father was David. And we know that David is described as a man after God's own heart. And we know that his son Solomon was a great king and a good king who was the wisest man that ever lived. But towards the end of his life, he started to allow those 700 wives and 300 concubines influence his worship with God. And Solomon began to let other gods be worshipped within the kingdom. And this habit was picked up also by Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam allowed for other little G gods to be worshipped in a kingdom that was set up by the big G God, the one and only God. Not only did Solomon set up uh, these this idol worship, not only did Rehoboam allow this idol worship to go on, but also his son, Abijah, Abijah allowed this idol worship to go on. So by the time Asa became king, there were three generations of his father who had allowed some mess to go on and Asa had to clean this mess up. And it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 14 that he removed the foreign altars and the high places and tore down the sacred pillars and cut down the ashram. Basically, he had to deal with the mess that his fathers had left. And my brothers and sisters, sometimes we have to deal with the mess that was left by, with us for prior generations. We have to deal with the mess that we learned when we were children on how to deal with life. But when we come to know God for ourselves, we see that uh, cussing folks out ain't the way we deal with life. We learned that putting our hands on people, putting these bees on them, what we used to call them in my day, is not the way we need to handle, handle life. But we need to handle life according to God's word. So maybe you have some issues and maybe you have some generational curses in your life, not because of you, but because of what your father and your father's father and your father's father had done. Maybe they used to run women. They may even used to run numbers. Maybe they used to be alcoholics. Maybe they were drug users. Maybe they were thieves. Maybe they were swindlers. Maybe they did life not according to God's word. And now you yourself have become an adult and you've come to know God for yourself. And God is saying you need to remove those things that your fathers have taught you. So Asa went about removing these things and not only did he, he remove the the uh the the idol gods he he was dealing he was dealing with his past he had to deal with his past he had to deal with his past but not only did he deal deal with his past he had to deal with the people that were around him and and, and the people that were around him it says in verse seven he told him he said let us build the cities and surround them with walls towers and gates and bars so he had a conversation with the people around him he said look y'all I'm having a serious relationship with the Lord. And if you're going to hang with me, if you're going to be with me, we're going to do things God's way. And we're going to take responsibility for the things that God has given us. So they built up the land. They, they started to protect the land. And because they were being obedient to God, God gave them peace. It says that the at the end of verse 1, the land was undisturbed for 10 years during his days. For 10 years, God gave Asa peace and God gave Asa the peace that he was able, Asa was able to use that peaceful time to, to rid himself of the mess that his fathers had built up. He was able to build up the things that God had given him. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, I got two things I want to say here before we get to our lesson for the day. You can't buy peace. God gives peace. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 26 that God gives peace to those whose minds are stead whose minds are on him. It, it, it says in, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, peace I give to you. It says in Philippians chapter 4 that it would, when we're praying and we make our supplications known to God and we're sincere in the things that we talk to God about, that his peace will be given to us that surpasses all understanding. So maybe you out there, you're trying to buy peace with a bigger house, with a nicer car, with a better job, with a prettier wife, with a, with a handsomer, handsomer, 
That's not a word. With a more handsome husband, you're trying to get peace by, by the people you surround yourself with. But God says, you can't buy peace. I give peace. And he gives peace to those who are serious about their relationship with him. See, you could be going through hell and hot water, but still have peace. Because peace is not determined about your circumstance, but peace is determined about your conversation and your relationship with God. And if you type with God, God says, I can give you peace in the midst of a storm. I can give you peace in the midst of a hellier situation. I can give you peace that passes all understanding. And he gave Asa peace. And since Asa had peace, not only did he get rid of the mess that his fathers brought in, not only did he, he begin to build up the things that were weak in the kingdom, he surrounded himself with some soldiers, some people that were ready to fight. Let me, let me back, let me back up because when I say he built up the things that were weak, that's a good lesson for us because we need to remember that in, in times of peace, when we're not going through a battle, when we're not going through a war, we need to strengthen our prayer lives. Sometimes we don't pray until we go through. And God says, when I give you peace, that means you need to strengthen your prayer life. How do you strengthen your prayer life when you're going through peace? Well, we, if you ain't gotten to pray for, for yourself, pray for everybody else. God will put people on your heart. He will allow people to cross your path for you to pray for, for you to go into his word and read his scriptures to learn how you should pray for that person, for that situation. And you're strengthening your prayer life because you're learning scriptures and you're praying those scriptures for specific individuals and you're developing a conversation with God that you can go to him and intercede on behalf of others. We need to strengthen our worship. We don't need to just worship God when we're going through, but we can worship God when everything is going all right. And we can tell him, God, I thank Thank you that I ain't going through right now. I thank you for the provisions and I thank you for the blessings. Not only do we strengthen our prayer, not only do we strengthen our worship, but we can strengthen our study of God's word. We can strengthen our memorization of God's scripture. We can strengthen our fasting life. There are a lot of things that we can strengthen that are weak when God gives us peace. And Asa, he strengthened the things that were weak in preparation for battle. And he surrounded himself, the Bible says, with 580,000 men, verse 8, who were ready to fight. And we need to be assured, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that in this, in, in, in this journey that we have people around us and that we are around people who mean us well spiritually and that we mean them well spiritually. Because sometimes we find ourselves around people who only want to tempt us to do the things that we've been saved from. We find ourselves getting around people who only want to bring out the worst in us. But God says, get you around some people. Get yourself around some people who will, who will encourage your spiritual side, who will encourage you to be more like God. My time is almost, almost gone. And I just want to touch on some things that we should be ready to share out of verses 9 through 15 in 2 Chronicles chapter 14. Asa, after 10 years, he finds himself now being faced with an enemy who is bigger than him. It tells us in verse 9 that this enemy had almost a million soldiers. And we just saw in verse 8 that Asa only had 580,000 soldiers. So this enemy that was coming against Asa was bigger uh, and was double the resources that Asa had. And like many of us, we find ourselves going through a situation that we don't have enough money, we don't know enough people, we don't have enough education to throw at it so that we can be successful. But God allowed this enemy to come. God allowed this enemy to come. God allowed this enemy to come because remember, my brothers and sisters in Christ, nothing can come to you unless it go through God. God allowed this enemy to come so Asa could realize, though I got all these resources, my ultimate resource is my relationship with God. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us not forget that no matter how much God bless us, let us not start, start uh, 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 appreciating the blessings more than we appreciate the blessors. So that's why sometimes God can't give us too much because we'll start worshiping that which God has given us and, not, and stop worshiping him. But Asa, Asa, what I like about this verse, I'm, I'm, let, let me go ahead and finish this, y'all. I'm getting excited. In verse 10, it says, so Asa went out to meet the enemy. He went out to meet him. One thing I want you to know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that when it comes time to fight spiritually, when it comes time to fight against physical obstacles, God has never told us to run. You will never find a, a verse in the scripture where God had his people retreat from the enemy. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we are to stand firm against the devil and his evil schemes in Ephesians chapter 6. 
In James chapter 4, the Bible tells us that we are to resist the devil and he will flee. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy, that he used the word of God and told Satan, get thee behind me. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to facing our enemy, God never tells us to run, but he tells us to meet our enemy face to face. Because when we look our enemy face to face, we realize that our enemy is bigger than us, but we realize that our God is bigger than our enemy. So Asa went out to meet his enemy. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, there are three basic enemies that we have in this life of Jesus Christ when we're living for the Lord. We have the enemy of the devil. We have the enemy of our own flesh and we have the enemy of this world culture. And all three of these enemies, Jesus says in John chapter 10, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy comes to steal our peace, to steal our joy, to steal our blessings from God, to steal our children, to steal our spouses, to steal and to take and to destroy us. But when we walk with God and when we trust in God, that which he tried to steal, God says no. That which he's tried to kill, God gives life. That which he tries to destroy, God maintains when we trust in God. So when it comes to facing the enemy of the devil, like I already said in James chapter 4, it says we are to resist him. In Luke chapter 4, it says we're to use the word against him. In Ephesians chapter 6, when describing the armor of God, it says we're to stand firm against the devil. Because the weapons of our warfare, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, are not carnal, but they're spiritual. No matter what battle, no matter what enemy we come to face, God has given us the provision. God has given us the weapon. God has given us his spirit and God has given us his presence that we can fight against any enemy that come against us. When it comes against the enemy of our own flesh, you know, the flesh wants to do its thing. The flesh is not for God. The flesh is not about God. So the Bible says you need to deny your flesh in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. When it comes to fighting our flesh in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it says we need to discipline our flesh and take charge over our flesh by the spirit of God that is within us. In Galatians chapter 5, it says if we walk by the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So if you're fighting the devil, if you're fighting the flesh, the Bible has given us instructions. The Lord has given us instructions on how to be victorious. And if we're fighting the world system, the world system is a system that promotes uh, uh, the flesh and, and, and promotes us uh, and promotes hum humanism and promotes us being about us being our own gods. The Bible says don't love the world or the things of the world, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. But love God. How do you defeat the world? Don't love the world. Love God. How do you defeat the world? Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of God's word and his spirit dwelling within you. So it's not a matter of are we going to fight? It's not a matter of do we have the resources to fight, but the, it's a matter of are you ready when it's time to fight? Or do you have the spiritual things in place to fight? What spiritual weapon did Asa pull out when he went out to meet the enemy? When he went out and he drew up in battle and he saw that the enemy was greater than what he had, Asa pulled out a weapon. He pulled out that spiritual arm of prayer. Yeah, you know, in the spiritual arm, it says we have the helmet of salvation. We have a breastplate of righteousness. We have the belt of truth in Ephesians chapter 6. We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. We have a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And it says we also have prayer. Asa was looking at his arsenal. He said, I know I got my salvation. I know I got my righteousness. I know I got my truth. I know I got good news about God, but you know what I'm going to use in this battle? I'm going to use prayer. And what he said in verse 11, he called on the name of the Lord and said, Lord, there is no one beside you to help in a battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. What I want you to realize is that Asa, even though he went to battle, even though he faced his enemy toe to toe, he did not go toe to toe with the enemy without who his God was or who his God is. He prayed, y'all. And the Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. The old church said, I have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him about all my troubles. He will hear my faintest cry and he will answer by and by. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, when it comes to war, don't you run away, but you run to God in prayer. And because Asa was able to pray publicly, this revealed that he had a private relationship with God. 
He called on the name of the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, there is no one besides you who to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. He said, look, 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 I ain't got no strength, so help us. God allowed this battle to come to Asa to show him his limits and, and, and to help him to recognize that God has no limits. Asa, yes, remember, he remembered what had been said in Genesis chapter 16, that there's nothing impossible for God. That there's nothing that our God can't do. He prayed. He said, God, 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 I know that there's no one like you. He remembered what his great, great grandfather said when he prayed that great prayer with Solomon in, in First Chronicles chapter 6. He said, if a prayer is lifted up to you in this place, you would deliver us from our enemies. And Asa said, I'm taking you up on that word, God. I'm calling out to you. So my brother and sister in Christ, when it comes to fighting our enemies, yes, we're to stand firm. Yes, we're to resist the devil. Yes, we're to use the word of God. But you better be praying in all that you're doing so that you can stand, so that you can resist, so that you can move forward. And because Asa had a relationship with God and because Asa depended on God, the Bible says in verse 12, that God showed up and he showed out. The Lord routed the Ethiopians before Asa. Yeah, they had to fight. Yes, they had to get involved in the battle. Yes, they had to get dirty. But the credit went to God because God showed up. God brought a miracle. He allowed 580,000 whoop up on a million people. That's impossible in human eyes, but it's very possible in God's eyes. And I want you to see something. I want you to see something because God, because God brought his army, in, in the, in, in, towards the end of verse 13, it says the, uh, they were shattered before the Lord and before his army. That's not referring to the 580,000 men that Asa had with him. That's referring to the legions of angels that God brought to bear on the situation. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to have our eyes of faith open for without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need to have our eyes of faith open and see that God is fighting for his people. God is fighting for his name. Because when our eyes are open, just like Elisha told his, 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 his little son in the ministry when they were being attacked by the king, he said, if you just have your eyes open, you can see that even though the king is attacking us, God has an army surrounding us that is stronger than the army of the king. God has legions of angels. Jesus said before he was crucified, if I just said the word right now, I have a legion of angels that are ready to come down and deliver me out of this mess. So just like Elisha saw God's army fighting on his behalf, just like Jesus knew that God had a legion of angels ready to fight on his behalf, my brothers and sisters in Christ realize and understand that God has for us, God has for us an army of angels that are ready to fight on our behalf. So as we go on in a, as we go on in the story, it says, after the Lord defeated them before his army, the rest of the verse says, and they carried away very much plunder. Yeah, God and his army destroyed them. And they said, that's probably all Asa wanted. But when God brings the victory, he brings the victory. Not only did he defeat the enemy, but he also blessed them with the enemy's resources that they had. My brothers and sisters in Christ, when God wins, he wins well. And he wins victoriously on behalf of his children. That's the God we serve. A God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we think or ask according to the power that has worked within us. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered to the hearts of men what God has in store for those who love him. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, when we resist the devil, when we stand firm, when we use God's word, when we are not conformed to the world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, when we deny ourselves and take up our crosses, when we walk by the spirit and not by the flesh, God says, I will blow your mind. Are you dependent on God in your battles? Or are you dependent on people? Are you dependent on God or are you dependent on money? Are you dependent on God or are you running away? My brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't care where you are in life. Whether you've disappointed God or whether you ran away from God, he's ready to fight on your behalf. 
the Bible says in Romans, Romans chapter 8, as I close. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? I challenge you today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to don't look at how big your enemy is, but remember how big your God is. Because there's nobody greater. Nobody greater. Nobody greater than our God. And there's no enemy in hell, on earth, or in the universe that can defeat our God. So align yourselves in your relationship with God and be confident in any battle that comes your way that God is able to deliver. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word and a reminder that there is no battle too great for you as we trust and believe in you. Bless this word, bless this lesson, in Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed, Sunday School. Y'all have a good one.